Hi, I'm Tom Gale, Director of GMA's Government Relations Office. I want to thank all the members of the Legislative Policy Council, including Chair Dorothy Hubbard, Mayor Baldini, for the engagement that they had during the legislative session. And I also want to thank all of you city officials who got in contact with your uh, state house members and your state senators on pieces of legislation that were important to your cities. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about eight bills and some upcoming bills that we anticipate next session. I'd like to start with House Bill 146. This legislation would require cities and counties to provide a certain level of benefits for firefighters who contract cancer. This legislation was brought by GMA as a response to the proposal last legislative session in 2016 that would have mandated cities and counties provide workers' compensation for cancer uh, that was uh, contracted by firefighters on the job. After uh, doing actuarial studies, we found that last year's legislation in 2016 would have been prohibitively expensive for local governments. Therefore, we decided to bring a less expensive package to the General Assembly, and that was House Bill 146. House Bill 146 uh, will be uh, active and effective uh, beginning January 1st. GMA has a frequently asked questions document that is on our website, and we're distributing it at all the physical listening sessions, but we'll post a link to it that will be on this webinar. I'd encourage your city officials to, to reach out to your HR directors, to your finance department, to your risk management people, and also contact GMA if you've got questions about how to meet this, this uh, benefit that will be required by state law. But I do want to, again, emphasize that this is going to be far less costly than the proposal that was introduced in 2016, and it recognizes that firefighters are important employees for the citizens of uh, your towns and cities. Senate Bill 85 passed the Georgia General Assembly this year, uh, created a limited exception to Georgia's three-tier system. That exception would allow for breweries and distilleries to sell on-site a uh, limited quantity per day by pour or by package. And they also have restrictions on the total amount that they could sell per year. Now, this is good for their industry because it increases their margins and it makes, it makes the uh, individual businesses more profitable. And it's good for downtowns, we feel, because a lot of these times, a lot of the times, the, uh, these breweries and distilleries will pick sites that are often underutilized or have been vacant for a long time. Uh, sites that may be too large for a retail establishment or a, uh, or a restaurant, uh, but maybe just right for their operation. And so we've seen, uh, we've seen these types of businesses spur economic activity in different cities around the state, and we're very encouraged uh, that the bill passed. We look forward to September 1st as the start date for this legislation. We'll be updating ordinances, or, or our model ordinances, and uh, our publications in regards to uh, alcohol taxation. House Bill 434 is a bill that will change the way that blight can be condemned through eminent domain. Current law says that anytime a city or county uses eminent domain to condemn property, we cannot sell such property to a private property owner or transfer such property to a private property owner for a period of 20 years. While for most situations this works out well and prevents abuse of the eminent domain system in the state of Georgia, in one aspect we've noticed over the past decade that this 20 year stop keeps cities and counties from dealing effectively with blighted property. Working with the Georgia Realtors Association over the off session, we came up with an idea that would eliminate this 20 year period, but provide property owners great due process rights and keep abuse of property away from governments. This bill, House Bill 434, is something GMA strongly supported along with the Georgia Realtors. And what it does as it adds an extra due process provision where it says that any city or county that wants to condemn for blight can transfer it directly to a private property owner or sell it to a private property owner upon the completion of the condemnation if the city or county first 
goes through a court procedure in Superior Court first to determine whether or not the property is actually blighted. This gives the property owner the ability to challenge that their property is blighted on one count. And then if the court finds that the property is actually blighted, the city or county can go back to court to do the condemnation procedure. And that will be the second court procedure, which will give the property owner two bites at the apple in challenging the city or county's action in condemning their property. Additionally, the bill will say that any property that has been condemned through this process cannot change land use for a period of five years. This means that if it's a single family residential property when the property is going through the condemnation procedure, that for a period of five years after the condemnation is complete, it cannot change from anything but a single family property. This means that if a developer was to build something on that property, and it was single family residential, they have to build single family residential for a period of five years after they complete the condemnation. Otherwise, they would be violating the law. We strongly support this bill. We had the support of the Georgia Realtors Association, and we had strong support from the cities of Savannah and Atlanta in pursuing this bill, and we believe that it will be great for Georgia's future and keeping blighted property out of our cities. GMA was excited to announce this, this session that we were able to pass four of our platform pieces. One of these was House Bill 73, which is a rural downtown development tax credit. Uh, it actually would create three separate ways in which uh, our uh, towns of 15,000 and under could to spur economic development. The first of which is for existing businesses. Any existing business that is able to create two full-time jobs would be eligible for this tax credit. The second is for uh, a business who relocates into the revitalization zone or target area. And this would allow for two created full-time jobs that exist, that relocated business would be eligible for the tax credit. And finally, anyone who renovates an existing building for the purpose of creating two full-time jobs would also be eligible for this tax credit. The tax credit will only be available in revitalization zones as designated by the Georgia Department of Economic Development and the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. We think that this is an excellent measured approach to create economic development engines in our small and rural downtowns. Senate Bill 222 is a new 911 bill that will revolutionize the way 911 fees are collected and audited in the state of Georgia. Currently, 911 fees stand at $1.50 per line with the exception of prepaid lines which are 75 cents per line. This bill would increase that 75 cents for prepaid lines to $1.50, evening out the charge per line across the board. But the big aspects of Senate Bill 222 are the way that the 911 fees are collected. Current law, the 911 fees are sent to each individual 911 provider. Most 911 providers are county operated, but there are a few city 911 providers. This bill would change that by saying the 911 fee would go to a statewide authority, a local government 911 authority, which would be comprised mostly of local government officials, including city officials. The 911 authority, the statewide 911 authority, would then be able to contract with the Department of Revenue for auditing of these telecom providers that are supposed to be collecting the 911 fees on their telephone bills. The local government 911 authority will go into existence this year in 2017. However, the auditing abilities will not come into effect until 2019, providing a phase in in this bill. Additionally, this bill will eliminate the ability of telecom providers for collecting cost recovery fees from the 911 fee. Current law says that telephone providers can take up to 30 cents of the $1.50 fee and sometimes actually up to 45 cents. This means that the $1.50 is actually really a $1.20 in a lot of cases or sometimes even a dollar and five cents. This bill would eliminate the ability of telephone, telephone providers from doing that. It would say that they would be able to collect cost recovery fees but that would be their own bill. 
which means that the entire $1.50 would go to the 911 systems, causing a big increase in revenue for 911 systems. That combined with the increase of prepaid wireless fees from $0.75 cents to $1.50 should be an increase in revenue. Additionally, the ability of the local government 911 authority to provide for statewide audits of telephone providers should collect more fees from providers that are not remitting to the local governments or are not even recognized in the state as having being providing service in the state. We think that this bill will increase revenue for 911 systems and will provide local governments uh, a path to the future for 911 technology. As much time as the GMA lobbying team spends advocating for bills that we think would be good for cities, we also spend a significant amount of time fighting bills that we think would be harmful for cities. One of these bills this past session was Senate Bill 2. It was the FAST Act. It was a Senate priority bill that basically would have mandated a permitting process for local governments to issue licenses and permits, mandating that they all had a streamlined process as well as an expedited process. GMA's belief was that this would actually be more of a burden for our local governments in permitting than it would be a help. Although the intent of Senate Bill 2 was to be business friendly, we actually thought that it wouldn't help the business community and it wouldn't necessarily streamline processes. We looked at what the standard application process and permitting process for cities were and we compared it to what the process would be if Senate Bill 2 were to passed. We looked at the standard application process for most municipalities where an applicant will submit an application to the city and they'll pay the regulatory fee and depending upon whether the application is completed or not, the applicant in the city will send the application back and forth until the application is complete. The city will then begin processing the application. They'll receive input from other agencies, whether it's the fire marshal or they'll do the save affidavit, and then the municipality will issue the permit or license. Senate Bill 2 would have required cities to establish certain timelines and fee schedules as it relates to the permitting process. The application process that would have been mandated under Senate Bill 2 would have required both a regular and an expedited process to be in place. So when an applicant submits an application, the city would collect 50% of that regulatory fee up front. The city would then have to review the application, determine whether or not it was complete, and then inform the applicant of the status, whether it was complete as well. Then from there, the city must meet the deadline that they set for processing of that application. If they issue the permit within the deadline, then they can collect the remaining 50% of the regulatory fee. However, if the city is not able to meet their deadline, there would be a reduction of the fees that they could collect, which would have been 10% per every 10 days late. And if the fee is reduced by more than 50% of that original fee amount, then the city would have to issue a refund to the applicant as well as issuing the license or permit. We were successful in stopping Senate Bill 2 this session, however, it will be active and eligible to be brought back up next session in 2018. House Bill 204 would prohibit local governments from placing fees or assessments on a property tax bill. Uh, this bill has been proven to decrease payments and increase the cost of government. Uh, while our local governments, such as the city of Norcross, have experience of separating their property tax bill like this bill would call for and showed a 20% lapse in payments, this is a very real impediment to local government and we will continue to fight it. This year, the bill did pass the House but did not pass Senate Finance Committee. We will continue to track this bill and be opposed to it. This past session, there were three telecom bills that we were successful in bottling up, but they will be active and eligible for next session. It was House Bill 518, House Bill 533, and then Senate Bill 232. All of these were industry-driven telecom bills at incentivizing the deployment of broadband throughout the state, but they came with significant preemptions of local government's control of the right-of-way, particularly with the permitting process, everything from the city's ability to control the aesthetics of the right-of-way to actually being able to charge a fair and reasonable rate for the usage of the right-of-ways. Because we know that these will be large fights for us come next year, we're looking at these discussions more over the summer and we'll be prepared better for next session. One of the exciting things that we're looking forward to 
this coming summer and in the interim between now and the 2018 session is House Resolution 389, the creation of the House Rural Development Council. This initiative by Speaker David Ralston uh, has been created to help uh, the General Assembly understand the needs of rural Georgia, particularly those economic centers, the small towns that are, are the large majority of members of GMA. We're excited about this initiative because uh, the study committee is going to look at access to health care, it's going to look at economic opportunities, it's going to look at tax policy and other economic development opportunities for rural Georgia. Uh, GMA plans to be very active in trying to promote the needs of our rural cities. And again, um, looking forward to the work in the interim of the House Rural Development Council. Now that the GMA spring listening sessions are complete, we would like to encourage you all to consider hosting a 2017 Hometown Connection. What that means is essentially getting government relations staff to sit down with your representatives, your senators, and talk about opportunities in your city, talk about GMA's priorities, and try to build a foundation for success in 2018. Thanks again for your engagement. Thanks again for participating in this this listening session, this online virtual listening session. And uh, we're gonna now open it up for, for comments, questions, ideas to help prepare us for 2018.